to do that, but um, uh, it is important um, on these occasions. Now, have I your approval to uh, sign the minutes of the last council meeting held on the 15th of May as a correct record? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any apologies for absence? Chairman, we have an apology from Councillor Graham. Thank you. Are there any other apologies? In that case, um, I uh, now have to ask for disclosures of interest. Are there any disclosures by members of personal and disclosable pecuniary interests in matters on the agenda? If so, please declare the nature of any such interest and whether members regard the personal interest as prejudicial under the terms of the Code of Conduct. Members are reminded to record their declarations on the sheets within their wallets and in the attendance register and also to reiterate them at the time the matter is discussed. So are there any? Yes, thank you, Councillor Kenwood. Thank you very much, Councillor Kenwood. Um, Councillor Ganley? Thank you. Are there any other? Right. Thank you very much. Item four. Um, before we begin, in order in accordance with paragraph 3.2a of the council procedure rules, I will exercise my discretion as the chairman of the council in favor of varying the order of business so that agenda item 11 is taken after the chairman's announcements. And now I would like to um, give my report. I'm pleased to say I have represented the council on the following occasions. The mayor making in this council chamber on May the 17th. On May the 19th, the opening on Ostler's Field breed of 13 houses, 10 for rent and three for shared ownership, built by Hasto Housing Association to a very high standard and with the latest insulation, which will make their running costs extremely low. The site has been beautifully landscaped with indigenous fruit trees. Members of the planning committee will remember the very overgrown site which had been earmarked as an exception site a long time ago, and I'm glad to report that finished buildings are most attractive and the new tenants are delighted with their new homes. Bexhill Horse and Dog Show, held at the Polgrave on Bank Holiday Monday, May the 29th, is a professionally organised, nationally recognised equestrian event which attracts many riders and their horses from a wide area. The show has been running successfully for very many years and includes jumping events, carriage driving, and dog agility, and I enjoyed it immensely. Later that day, on June the 1st, I was in the Mayor's Parlour, sorry, later that week, on June the 1st, I was in the Mayor's Parlour Brighton Town Hall with other council chairmen and mayors from East Sussex for a meeting with the Lord Lieutenant, Peter Field. He spoke to us about the need to identify and recognise those who have given selfless, voluntary service to others and who should now be recommended for an award or to become guests at royal garden parties. He would like to see opportunities for more royal visits to our district. We may know of other people in our own areas who work tirelessly for good causes without expecting a reward and the Lord Lieutenant would now like to see them being rewarded. Something very different on June the 7th was a celebration of Hastings when the Mayor of Hastings invited Council Chairman and Mayors from East Sussex to a light-hearted evening with local instrumentalists and singers to celebrate the talent which exists in Hastings in a concert at St Mary in the Castle. On a very hot day, June the 18th, even hotter than today, I think, there was a cyclist exhibition on the lawn in front of the Delaware Pavilion. All aspects of cycling were included, 
Many stallholders were promoting the health benefits of cycling. There was a special section for physically handicapped riders, and there were daredevil stunt riders with international reputations who kept everyone on their toes with their amazing antics. There were folding bikes, mountain bikes, and bikes for hire, but the message was clear. Cycling is good for you. Have a go. Council Hollage, that's for you. At the end of June, on Monday the 26th, the chairman of East Sussex County Council held a reception at Ashburnham Place, giving an opportunity to meet again the mayors and chairmen of the district in addition to members of East Sussex County Council. Sorry, I'm now speaking fast because you must be getting bored. The evening finished with a performance of excerpts from Much Ado About Nothing performed by the Bowler Crab Company. This went on to tour locally, finishing with a performance at the St John Centre Bexhill last Saturday. They're coming back to Bexhill in the autumn with a performance of Othello, so I hope we'll all get along to that. Last Sunday, the Pestalozzi village Sedlskam organized their first cavalcade of transport, which brought in large numbers of vintage cars and their owners. The Bullnose Morris Society was well represented, and there were scores of commercial and private vehicles, all in pristine condition. The owners were very pleased to talk about how they'd, in some cases, rebuilt their cars after finding them in a near ruined state in the back of barns and old garages. It was an opportunity also to talk to students from the villages who come to this country to get an education at school and at university, which would be completely unavailable to them at home. They were eager to talk about their aspirations and the benefits they'll bring eventually to their home villages. Most want to be engineers and scientists. On Friday, Bexhill Museum opened its new exhibition called People Object Place, which is about the migration of people to this region and the circumstances which lead to it. The event was attended by families who, because of threat to life caused by war, have found themselves living far from home, often without knowing the language and in straitened circumstances. The exhibition shows how towns like Bexhill over the centuries have taken in victims of war and oppression, some of whom never return home, but who have been shown to have left a cultural benefit by being here. Bexhill Sixth Form College and Sussex Coast College Hastings have helped put on the exhibition with the aid of lottery funding, and it's on for the remainder of the year. And while you're in the museum, there's some newly acquired dinosaur bones from the brickfield. The size of the bones indicate a creature of about the length of a family car. I recommend a visit. <laughs> the last visit to report, I was invited to Hurstman Sioux Castle yesterday for the beating of the retreat. After the reception by the Lord Lieutenant, we were entertained by the band of the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, which is made up of highly gifted army reservists. As the name implies, beating the retreat is dependent on skilled drummers. Originally, a drummer would tour the battlefield camp to warn soldiers it was time to return to barracks. Now this is ceremonial, and we saw and heard some of the fine examples of synchronized drumming from three experts in their field. Final moment to remember was the playing of the last post by six post horns high up in the towers of the castle. So that is what I've been up to for the last couple of months, um, and I'm very, very grateful to have had that opportunity. Um, one other thing I would like to tell you is that I'm planning to have my civic service slightly out of the norm, but because I'm a rural member and live in Etchingham, I would like to hold this in Etchingham Church on the 20, Sunday the 24th of September. I would be delighted if you could all come. Uh, it will start at 11 o'clock and the service will be conducted by um, Ian Morrison. Um, we will adjourn after the service to the uh, bistro, which some of you will remember visiting, possibly members of the planning committee, uh, where we'll have refreshments. So that's on the 24th of September. So that is my report. And having um, read the, the necessary uh, uh, part of the agenda, which moves item 11 to number four, I would very much like to welcome, uh, sorry, Chairman, I, I omitted to um, declare the interest and interest that I'm a patron of the Delaware Pavilion. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Prochak. Can we put that in the... Thank you very much for pointing that out. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to welcome um, Mr. Stewart. Drew. Yeah. I uh, regret uh, the need to ask for silence and custody of the Delaware Pavilion. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed, Councillor Hart. Um, um, oh, we're all getting to our feet. Here. I'm a chairman, <laughs> uh, 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 yes. director of the Trust. Thank you very much. Good. Um, yeah, are there any more? No, nope. yeah. I think we've got all the relevant members of the committee. That's fine. So can I now welcome uh, Mr. Stuart Drew, director and chief executive of the Delaware Pavilion, and he's going to present 
the Delaware Pavilion Charitable Trust Annual Update. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, I'm Stuart Drew. I'm Director and Chief Executive of the Pavilion. Been in post since 2012 uh, and been working at the Pavilion since 2005. So thank you very much for coming to ask me to do our annual report. Um, there is a very full report which I understand has been tabled today, which is in front of you. Well, we are very keen that um, all of our activities are very carefully documented so hence the very full report. As I understand, you've just had it tabled today. So if there's any follow-up uh, questions relating directly from the report, then I'm available on email uh, or for a meeting to follow up on any of that. Um, what I'd like to do is to back that up with a short presentation, and then indeed there'll be an opportunity for questions afterwards as well. Um, I would hope that you would have noticed over the last three or four years that one of our real priorities is how we engage with people and particularly our communities within Bexhill at the Pavilion. I'm working very hard on that. Please excuse this not very good picture, it's actually taken off my phone. But for me it was a really important point for us. We've just recruited a new head of exhibitions that's joined us from the Liverpool Biennale. And in presenting our summer show, Simon Patterson, Rosie Cooper has been really, really keen to not only to present national, internationally acclaimed artists, but to work with our local community. So this exhibition has included a partnership with Bexhill Museum and with Hastings Museum, um, but also really importantly, creating a new artwork in collaboration with Bexhill Sailing Club. So it was really nice when we opened Simon Patterson's show, which you can pop down and see at the moment. Um, we, ha we had a private view. It was also very nice that we had a wedding on, a commercial activity at the same time. And the dinner was held at Bexhill Sailing Club. So there was this really nice meeting of the art world, of the contemporary art world, but also of key members within our Bexhill community. So that's really, really important point for me and to, um, to signal how we're going to go forward, particularly with our learning and participation programs, working with the gallery. Um, and you can see how that's taken forward to the local press and communicated. And indeed, our visitor numbers to the exhibitions have been up as a result, as a result of that, and also softening the contemporary visual art nature of that exhibition so it's still very much relevant to the national media and the national press but very much engaging local people and people within the region in that exhibition again the work that we've done with communities has been incredibly <laughs> wide-ranging particularly over the last year to 18 months we've been very lucky to have some additional funding from the paul hamlin foundation um, and for me to doing some doing some really important work at how we uh, engage our communities, not only with the artistic programme, but with the heritage and the building as well. So this is our Mercury Group for people with complex needs and very much continues the work that we've been doing over the last few years with Project Artworks, um, which are a disability arts um, charity based in Hastings. Uh, but very much embedding that work within the pavilion, making sure that we're accessible, making sure that my team, from our curators right through to our cafe team, um, now know how to deal with a range of people, including those with complex needs, with dementia, et cetera, et cetera. Really important to us. Um, and indeed, this is one of the participants from Project Artworks. I was really, really pleased, again, about the crossover right throughout the organisation. And this is um, Sharif Perso, um, dressed as Al Murray. He's got an Al Murray mask <laughs> in front of his face. I don't know whether you can see from the picture. But of course, we've recently had Al Murray on at the pavilion as well. So it was Al Murray, somebody with complex needs, uh, meeting Al Murray. And in fact, the film was made and televised on Channel 4 as part of their Random Acts program. So really starting to join things up. This is where the technology is going to stop working. Keep going. There we go. And then just running through a range of other activities, um, dancing activities, again, happening within the gallery space. A bit of yoga, 
happening within the gallery space. Very much trying to engage people with the artistic program. Um, on the other side of things, you will be aware of our very popular outside films that we run for free over the summer. Uh, this was a group of children from Sydney um, engaging with the Lion King on our terrace. Um, and indeed, that's part of um, a programme that we continue to run. Heart of Sydney participants are creating their own trailers for some of the films this year that will be shown be before those main programmes. Um, and also um, creating VIP areas for some of those individuals. So some of those individuals who don't normally visit the Delaware Pavilion, even though they're one, two miles away from us, and there was a big discussion about creating a VIP area for those individuals. They didn't know what a VIP area was and treating those people, creating special areas so that they can enjoy those films and access those films. I don't know whether you can read this, but this is a really nice, we've had a, a few of these recently, just in feedback from one of the St. Richard's teachers about our learning team just saying how much the relationships evolved, particularly over the last year, and how they're really pleased to be working with us so that school children can access those programs too. And the highly successful dementia screenings, uh, we run very accessible film screenings that are run with the lights up, um, with breaks in the films, uh, so that people can uh, take some food or visit the bathroom, um, with, with um, singing, with dancing going on in the middle of the films, aimed at people with dementia and their families. But again, really, really interesting how wide of fa families attend uh, with their children, with people with other mental and physical disabilities coming to those screenings and really taking part. Capacity of 200 people sold out pretty much every time and delivered in, in collaboration with Film Hub South East. And again, engagement activities for young people, um, crossing over into the live programme, young bands activities, uh, private views of exhibitions for young people, those kinds of things. Um, also really, really be pleased to be uh, involved in this thing called the Cultural Education Partnership. And this is something that is, um, uh, chair is run by Culture East Sussex, um, which is chaired by um, the County Council. Um, and is looking at skills development between schools and further education and culture, um, and also looking at health and wellbeing needs as well. And that's been run in collaboration with uh, what's called HAREN, which is the Hastings and Rother Arts Education Network, so led by Melanie Powell here at Rother, um, and by colleagues at Hastings Borough Council as well, very much to try and improve access to schools um, and for us, looking at that health and wellbeing agenda. We've also, I hope you will have noticed, we've improved our website that was long overdue for an update. It's so much easier to access, to see everything in one place. Everything's much more accessible there. And also for us commercially, much easier to book tickets, even on your mobile. Built for mobile platforms, 70% of our users now are accessing our website on their phones or on their tablets. So very much taking a slightly different approach to the website. Just quickly on tourism. Um, we've had a lot of involvement in tourism and a lot of lobbying, again, over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. Uh, this was Fiona Banner's um, exhibition that was part of the Route 1066 Festival, which was seeking to slightly contemporise that um, 1066 country brand. Um, uh, we've worked very closely with East Sussex County Council in bringing all the tourism research that already exists all together in one place so that you can look at industry trends there, you can look at visitors' trends there, you can see where visitors are coming from. And there's now a rollout of that process through County Council in training a range of businesses how to look at that data to see how they might market their business or grow their business as a result. So it's a really important piece, uh, a really important tool that's available through East Sussex in figures. And um, again, through that process is really starting to make the case for tourism. You can see the figures in front of you, but very, very significant impact of tourism, very significant growth over the last 10 to 12 years 
If you remember your original investment in the Delaware Pavilion reopening in 2005, if you look at those 10 years, the growth, 40% roughly, in growth in tourism spend over that time. Um, and also, we now start to have county-wide figures that we can start to talk up the tourism economy and the visitor economy, because actually it's really, really important to us and an important employer, over 30,000 jobs. Um, the other really great thing about the region, both for 1066 region and for the wider East Sussex, is people's satisfaction rate. You can see well over 90%. So if we can get people here, we know their experience in general of the county and of the region is really, really high, which I think is really, really good for us. Um, and then just to briefly talk about um, our exhibition, so there was nine partners. This is our model, which was loaned from Bexhill Museum at a venue called Two Temple Place on the north back of the bank of the Thames, just near Somerset House. Um, had over 50,000 visitors promoting all the Sussex cultural venues. Um, reams and reams of press. There's a bit more detail in the report about the amongst... There's just two double-page spreads here, but I think there was almost like 10 or 15 double-page spreads, radio, TV, those kinds of things, right off the back of that exhibition. Really important to us. Um, railway advertising, both for the exhibition itself and for a new campaign called Sussex Modern, which again is promoting the wider cultural offer um, in East Sussex. These posters do about 250,000 views a day. These are at Charing Cross, as you walk out of Charing Cross. So really trying to up the ante, and you'll see we've been doing Bexhill campaigns off the back of that, really starting to raise our profile. And you mentioned royal visits and royal endorsement of what we're doing. Really nice, the Duchess of Cornwall coming to visit that exhibition as well, and the opportunity to show round her around the objects that were borrowed from Bexhill Museum and representing Bexhill. Um, just lastly, um, we're involved in a project called Cultural Coasting. So in making that case, um, we're trying to raise um, over £1.3 million for investment throughout the Selep area, so working with Essex and Kent. It's very much based on our coastal cultural trail, so in the trail that we developed for £200 between Hastings and Eastbourne, with us in the middle, but trying to roll that out further, working with really high-profile artists to encourage visits to the coast right around that region. And we pretty much were just waiting for Visit England's investment. All the other investment has pretty much been confirmed. So I think it's really exciting. Of course, Roaring Twenties. We're looking forward to Roaring Twenties in a couple of weeks. Our footfall, 410,000 last year, um, down slightly from the previous year, and I'll say a few words about that in a minute. But I'd like to reassure you that we're still up there with um, cultural venues in cities. So if you look at Tate Liverpool, um, if you look at what Tate St Ives doing, the Fitzwilliam in Cambridge, those sorts of similar visitors, although we're in a small seaside town, with a population of 40,000 people, actually we can act like a city in terms of our cultural provision. Um, media coverage, Peter Blake and Elizabeth Price, regular slots on the local BBC News. Um, this was actually a venue hire fashion shoot for The Observer that went out a few weeks ago. Not only does it, uh, does it earn us revenue, but it also promotes us as a venue too. Um, to speak very briefly about artists, I mentioned Simon Patterson. This is Simon Patterson's piece with the, with the sailing club. But looking to support artists on all sorts of levels, this is our, what's called our Pecha Kucha Nights, um, which is very fast-paced presentations by local businesses, creative industries, creative individuals um, that have a very short slot to present to, to each other regularly getting over 100 people in our restaurant space there, sharing, networking, building businesses, creative businesses, non-creative businesses coming together. Um, and also um, our experimental music. The Pavilion, of course, is a very forward-looking institution, was back in the 1930s, dealing with film, visual arts, music, 
live performance, all those kinds of things. And we're, we really want to see the auditorium. We have a very, uh, we have a viable commercial model in the auditorium. We want to start to be able to push that program forward and be able to take a few more risks. Again, this was some of our program uh, in London. So just to round up um, a few challenges, this is one of, the one of the southern rail platforms. This is what London thinks um, from, from a few months ago. London thinks it, the southern rail dispute will cost London, the Chamber of Commerce. I don't know whether the same amount of work has been done um, for Sussex. I know that our live ticket sales are down almost 25% year on year, and I know our visitor projections are almost down 10% as a result. And we're here, I've got members of staff who aren't at work today because of the rail strike, because they haven't been able to get here. Um, I know we've had to put buses on for audiences to be able to get home uh, after performances because there aren't any trains. And just to reinforce that this is not only having a significant effect on our business, but also the perceptions. Even when the trains are running properly, there's still a major perception issue that we are a backwater and the trains aren't working effectively. That's all I would say on the issue. You know, we will counteract this. This is Nelly. Um, the Bexel Observer ran with this headline, US, US rap superstar smashes our box office sold out in eight minutes. So we'll continue to fight against that. I'm not rolling over because there's problems with the trains. We will do our best to counteract that. But nonetheless, it is quite a challenge. Um, and then just lastly, to talk a little bit about growth and, growth and heritage. Um, we've seen these places pop up over the last kind of 18 months. Um, which is really, really exciting for us. And I think we've seen our weddings business and our conferencing market grow um, reasonably significantly because of this investment. Um, and of course, we're very close to Weatherspoon's opening as well in the next week or so. Um, so the development of the evening economy, I think with external investors and with us trying to very much inject life into our evening program, um, we're starting to see the benefits of that. Um, and of course the impact the link roads had as well and um, we're seeing business sponsorship and commercial business sponsorship of the pavilion and things like our jobs fair really starting to take off. I've been working on business sponsorship um, at the pavilion for almost 12 years and it's only in the last 18 months that we've started to see that investment um, from corporates, so, which is really exciting. And just to kind of leave you with a, with a headline, I think our thinking is that we, um, we've been developing a new business plan, so we'd, you will have known that we're just in receipt of uh, the refreshing of our Arts Council investment for the next four years, which is really good. We're hoping that Arts Council are also going to invest in some of our music program nationally um, to allow us to tour and develop some of our own program. Uh, which we're hopefully we'll get an announcement in the next couple of days on. Um, we're very much working on the building. Uh, we're work very much working on building surveys to know what it is to be in control of the building, know what we need to do with the building, but also meshing that with our business plan to see where the opportunities are for growth uh, commercially in terms of developing other space within the site and also the impact that the seafront's had over the last four or five years in changing demographics, changing access, changing public realm. So we're in the middle of, uh, at the moment of trying to raise some funds to move towards an options appraisal feasibility study for further investment. If we can couple that together with uh, not only a train service that works effectively but is potentially an upgrade to that rail service and with the addition of um, more hotel rooms and more accommodation providers there is the real potential for us to outperform those venues in cities, I believe, and push our visitor numbers to 600,000 and maybe beyond. But that's trying to create the right environment over the next four or five years for that to happen. Thank you, that's me. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Councillor Maynard.
Thank you. Have you a seconder? Thank you very much, Councillor Cameron. Um, are we all in agreement? Yes, thank you. In that case, um, could we possibly have your... Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Clark. <coughs> thank you, Chairman. Um, what I like about the Delaware management at the moment is they're quite ready to listen to constructive criticism. I can't believe Stuart's been post five years, the years have gone so quickly. But one of the first things I said to him when he first took in post was, when there's six weeks of children or school, there's not a lot on the Dell of War for young people. I've just picked up your programme, there are nine events for toddlers and young people during July and August, which, which is tremendous. I mean, it's really, really good. You've got the outdoor films as well. So I really think you've reacted to that and you've, you've, you've actually presented a much better programme. Uh, secondly, um, with, with the online booking system, I can never get a ticket to a music concert. They're gone <laughs> in half a day or a day. So I like, keep trying. But, um, and also, uh, you did touch on it, but there's no doubt the, the value to the local economy of the Delaware is tremendous. When the weather's nice and there's a good show on, all the restaurants on the seafront are full with customers generating their trade and their business and other um, industries in the town. So it, it really does a lot for the local community. And over the many years I've been a councillor, people have said, oh, the cost of the Delaware, is it really worth it? Well, I was doing a bit of research. Although everybody in rubber contributes, it's about £10 a, a year that people have to contribute their council tax towards the Delaware. What a bargain. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. Councillor Hard. Yes. Um, thank you to Stuart there for giving us that um, very good report. And just to say that as Rother's portfolio holder for tourism and culture, I'm delighted that you have got that um, award from Arts Council England um, for the Delaware. Um, and also that Rother continues to, to provide grant funding to the Delaware as well. I mean, it does provide an amazing uh, attraction for tourism and culture to this area. Uh, and that's really important. Of course, it is disappointing. Maybe disappointing is too weak a word to use. It's, it makes me, and I know it makes a lot of people very angry that the Southern Rail dispute is continuing yeah, yeah. to have an impact on visitor numbers to the whole area. Um, and um, it, this has a huge impact on our local economy, and that's not a good thing. But what it is, what I do want to say is that um, Rother is very keen on uh, continuing that uh, grant funding in terms of uh, the, what you provide to social cohesion, health and well-being, and our visitor economy, uh, tourism and regeneration as a whole that the Delaware contributes not only to Bexhill but to East Sussex. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Mr. Drew, I would just, I, unless anybody else would like to speak. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, Councillor Hughes. <laughs> We're very happy about it. But one thing, one small part of your presentation I'd like to reinforce, if I may, Stuart. I'm so grateful for the films you put on for the Dementia Society. Because quite honestly, I, th I, get, the I get the comeback from that. I know what goes on. And I do know how, how much they're appreciated. I hope they're going to continue in the new year as well. Uh, as, as much as possible. And just the other thing, please forgive me for asking a silly question, because you did know I was going to come and do this, didn't you? Um, on your presentation, that we've all had sheets and sheets to read in the afternoon, um, particularly the profile list, the headlines, the headings of the profiles. Who, th who thought those up? Go on, tell me who thought, thought those that was Councillor Gannon. Sorry. Um, there's, there's lots of industry standard segments for audiences. Um, this is one that actually Arts Council have bought into. So what's, although some of the headings um, are rather unusual or some of the descriptions you may find rather unusual, um, actually, what Arts Council has done is standardised data collection right across the country, actually. So we feed into a system to see how we compare um, across the southeast or across nationally, visual arts, live, 
live performance. And it's actually a really, really useful tool. But I, I agree that there's some of the descriptions may seem um, a little odd. We're coming back then. Uh, one, the wonderful thing that didn't upset me, but I was a little bit concerned about, was the last one, Heydays. That rather upset me. The group least likely to attend, many live in... Sh they seem very sad. Can we do nothing about that to encourage people in this sheltered or specially adapted accommodation for older people, often excluded from many activities due to raft of health, access and resource barriers? I mean, knowing what I do know about dementia sufferers, how glad they are to come to the Delaware, I would like to think that perhaps we could reach out to other people. I, I, think, I think that's a really key point, and I think what some of those segmentations help us to do is to identify the audiences that we're not necessarily serving. So you will see from the front end of my report, from my presentation, that we've been very keen to address that. Um, you know, uh, four or five years ago, we weren't that kind of engaged or relevant to our communities. We've come a long way since, uh, since Councillor Clark was highlighting. Um, but actually what this segmentation does is allow us to drill down. So we all know that we're in some of, we have some of the most deprived communities amongst us with Sydney and Central. Um, so it's very much trying to drill down and very much trying to uh, work out how we can be relevant to um, those communities and engage those communities and raise aspirations, etc. So I think those segmentations are really good to challenge us and to say, we're not necessarily pulling enough people in from some of those communities. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, as somebody who was quite critical of the Delaware Pavilion, as I'm sure Stuart remembers, I've gone from being a bit critical to being very supportive because I think what's improved beyond anything else is the content of the, the productions that you put on in the um, theatre because now you've got very diverse um, I've got a son who is, I sent you earlier who's greatly into bands and he tends a lot of the things and yet equally Stuart and I have attended an awful lot of things as well um, so it does you are reaching the different age groups which I didn't think he did at one time so I think congratulations to you for achieving that because it's not easy I must admit sometimes I see something on that thing who the devil's that <laughs> I say to my son Oh, for goodness sake, you should know they're very famous. And I say, all oh, right, okay. So it's great that you can appeal to across the board. Well done, Stuart. Thank I think. you very much. Thank can you. I now ask Councillor Maynard to wind up? Thank you very much, Stephen. And to thank Stuart, obviously, for that very, very um, comprehensive um, presentation. And furthermore, just I think because we have a number of members of the public here this evening, it's also worth highlighting that the Delaware Pavilion at the last funding round in terms of the Arts Council funding. I believe it was one of only two sites in the country that attracted that level of funding. Mm -hmm. Clearly, this authority uh, puts in a large sum each and every year. But I think the continued commitment of the Arts Council, that good working relationship that the Delaware Pavilion has through Stuart and his management team with the Arts Council ensures that this money comes from all people. Williams has alluded to, that progressive management approach, that um, compelling, comprehensive offer that we've seen at the Delaware Pavilion ensures that there is something for everybody um, in, in terms of the, the offer that, 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 that you clearly display, and I think that you should be congratulated for your efforts. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Mr. Drew, it just remains for me to wish you a a pleasant journey home, I think full of the rosy glow, which is possibly not just caused by the heat, <laughs> but because of the level of satisfaction that we have in you for your uh, huge amount of enthusiasm and your success uh, in running, um, uh, running the Delaware. So thank you so much for coming. If you'd like to remain with us, you're very welcome, but if you would like to leave, that's your prerogative too. That's okay. okay, thank you.
And now item five, to answer questions from members of the public, uh, if any, in accordance with paragraph 10 of the council procedure rules, time limit 30 minutes. Right, so the first question is from Mr. Paul Cortell to Councillor Kenwood. Um, Mr. Cortell, do you wish, uh, do you want to read your, out your question in full? Or, or would you uh, I would, like Madam to... Chair, because there are quite a few people on the visitor's seats who might be interested in it. Thank you. In that case, please, please start. Thank you. Uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, my question is about the Community Governance Review for Bex Hill, Stage 2, um, the consultation. Um, I understand that local councillors are able to provide additional postcards to residents who require them. And I would add, Madam Chair, this was written um, before the Cabinet met and um, made alternative arrangements. So I'll read on. Should D4B, whose objective is to promote the consultation, be offered a supply of these cards that they can offer to residents who require them? Thank you. Um, Councillor Kenwood, would you like to reply, please? Thank you. Um, Mr. Cortell, do you have a supplementary question? I do, madam. Thank In you. In that case, could we hear you, please? Um, the Community Governance Review Steering Group sensibly recommended that explanatory literature and a reply card be posted to every household in Bexhill. Um, I understand the reason that the communication plan is being currently reviewed, as um, the deputy leader has just um, uh, told us, is that the all-conservative cabinet has overruled the steering group by suppressing the printed public information on cost grounds. Um, Mr. Cortell, can I just stop you a moment? Could you ask a question? I think Certainly, you're just Madam. A I was just giving the background. I apologise. Um, um, uh, my question is, if Rother Council is so impoverished, will the Deputy Leader recommend to his fellow councillors that responses on response cards printed by D4B, that's democracy for Bex Hill, at their own expense, be considered valid stage two consultation responses so that a truly democratic consultation can prevail. Councillor Kenwood. Uh, that fact is incorrect, Councillor. Um, thank you, Mr. Cortell. We now move on to the second que um, question, which is from Councillor Prochak. Uh, thank you. It's working. Oh, well. Some things in rather work. The... Um, uh, my question was about the flagpoles. Uh, I don't know if everybody's noticed them, these two huge things at the front. You can't miss them, no. They don't look in proportion to me. Sorry, I will go have a question. Um, and thank you for giving me the cost. And my assumption is that it was a management decision, and not an executive decision, to actually get these two flagpoles. don't know why we need two, but there we are. Um, and my question is about how, how, what the process is between management decisions and executive decisions. So, for example, I was concerned some time ago that it was a management decision that we didn't pursue the blue flag in right. terms of the importance for tourism. What is the process between management decisions and executive decisions? And we do know there have been reports that have never come to the executive um, that may have been quite important. Right. Uh, Councillor Maynard, can you help Councillor Project on this, please? Yeah. I'm more than happy to give... Uh, Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mrs. Prochak, do you wish to ask a supplementary question? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Right. Um, I 
item seven, to receive the report of the Cabinet on matters for determination. Um, so, Councillor Maynard, please. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman. I remove the report of the meetings held on the 8th of May and the 3rd of July to be approved and adopted. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Kenwood. Right, in that case, I'll call over the, the items. Um, so we're looking at the 8th of May 2017, CB1698. Is that right? That's it. And the 3rd of July, the Community Governance Review for Bexhill. Oh, sorry, I'm going, I'm looking for a number there. Oh, I've got the wrong page here. Page two. Ah, okay. I'm there now. Um, right, so it's CB1698, CB1702. Yep, thank you. Uh, I think Mrs. Prochat, sorry, Mrs. Prochat, was that 1702? Yes, thank you. 1703, 1704. Right now. I move that the whole of the report, with the exception of the reserved minutes, be approved and adopted or received. All those in favor? Thank you. Anyone against? Thank you very much. Councillor Kenwood. The method of the public communicating back to us um, regarding these um, these cards, etc. Therefore, I'd like to move an amendment. Um, I'd like to move um, that we convene a further meeting of the steering group to formally agree the precise nature of the second stage of the Bexhill Governance Review. And I'd like to include on that at no additional cost to the council. Thank you. Have you a seconder? I believe I do have a seconder. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Hollidge. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Do you wish to um, speak to that now? Oh, sorry, Mrs. Projack. Councillor Mrs. Boucher. Sorry, I don't understand the amendment. How, what does it? What is it meant? Is the meeting at no extra cost? The, Sorry, le the you... leaflet at no extra cost? I don't understand it. Councillor Chairman, Kenwood, perhaps would you I like to add clarification, like please? The meeting will obviously cost the council some money. I'm talking about stage two of, of the uh, review, and the consultation with the public should be at no additional cost, cost. to this council. Thank you. Councillor Mrs. Frochard. I wish to give notice that I wish to move a further amendment. You wish to, yeah. and have you a second of that? I haven't moved it yet. No, but would you like to move your uh, amendment? Um, is that right, or do we have to vote on the first one first? Uh, in that case, just hold on one moment, Mrs. Proch, and just and we'll move that. Can we um, hear the amendment, please? Yes. of the Bexhill Government Review at no additional cost to this council. Thank you. Could we now proceed to a vote on that amendment, please? Uh, those in favor? <coughs> and those against? And now there's a further amendment. Sorry, Councillor Mrs. Prochak, would you like to present your amendment? 
Sorry, may I, may I? Councillor Oliver. Yes, yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, with regard to no further expenses uh, to be uh, incurred by uh, Rother District Council, I would like to explore the opportunity of whether or not any additional expenses in order to bring the transparency and openness to Bexhill residents through the communication could be charged to the Bexhill Special Expenses Account. Um, I understand from Cabinet the concern was the rural members feeling that perhaps this shouldn't come out of the reserves, but I'm led to believe that the Bexhill Special Expenses Account is a line of finance into the uh, rather coffers, and I do feel this is such an important part of the communication uh, with residents of Bexhill who who really feel that they want to know exactly what the facts are, being given this opportunity in a communication. It was failed to be done at the beginning of the communication, where the process was going to be done by the internet, of which 40% of our residents don't have access to. Um, and, and just to clarify a couple of other points with regard to um, democracy for Bexhill. Just a second, Councillor. I, I think we've actually got this as, a, as an item to, to, to discuss on the agenda. Would you prefer to, to make well, if that Well, if it's going to be able to be dis discussed on the agenda, I, certainly. I would be grateful if you could remove it. It is. Councillor Maynard, I think possibly you might help me on this because uh, I, I don't want to deprove. Yes. Um, the advice that we received at the time of Cabinet, um, in terms of if, if there was a parish, it wouldn't, it wouldn't vote, vote for itself, as it were, mm. and therefore it was a district wide thing. Councillor Oliver, are you happy about that? Uh, all I'm asking is is there an opportunity to explore whether or not those special expenses accounts could be used in some way towards making this a, a very valid uh, communication with our residents. Thank you, Councillor. Can, can this possibly be discussed at the steering group? Yes, thank you very much indeed for your question. Right. Um, and now, Councillor Mrs. Pro oh, sorry, Councillor Mrs. Field. Thank you, and actually I am Councillor Field. Councillor Field, Field Mrs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'd like some clarification, if I may, uh, Madam Chairman. Yeah. I don't understand why we voted on this amendment before we debated it fully. And secondly, I don't understand why we voted on the amendment before we heard what the other amendment was. I thought it was normal practice to have all amendments tabled and vote on them in logical progression. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, if I may, on, on a point of clarity, our procedure has been that we take amendments in order, vote on them, revert to the original one. If there's a further amendment, then that is... Is, is tabled, which then again, if that falls, reverts to the original one. So that, that has been our procedure, hence why the vote was taken in that order. Thank you. And is it also a procedure then to vote before the debate? That's not a comment I can interpret like that. No. Yeah. I can't answer that. There was an opportunity. No. Just ask Councillor Prochak what her mind is. Uh, Councillor Prochak, I think. <laughs> At this stage, it would be nice to know what your amendment um, is. We don't have an answer for that, no. Um, you are the recommendation, the four recommendations, um, sorry, the, yeah, the four recommendations, and in part one, there are four separate recommendations there. Um, option one, no change. I argued for that at the steering group because clearly the majority, majority of people wanted change but I was told that you've got to have an option of status sorry, quo. Sorry, Councillor Project, I'm having difficulty in hearing you, so could you speak up a little? I'm so sorry. That's all right. It's having a woman's voice. It's not deep enough. Um, thank you. Um, option two um, was the parish stroke town council for the whole of Bexhill. Option three, the creation of an area committee for Bexhill. I don't know if Cabinet, unfortunately I wasn't able to go, I don't know whether Cabinet realised that if you go for an area committee um, for Bexhill, then there's the cost of setting maybe one or two up in the rural areas too, because it ought to be covered. Yeah. Um, you're well aware, I'm so happy to hear that. They, um, but to the actual Cabinet to say that they can't have any executive powers means that it's just a talking shop. But... Leaving that aside for a moment, my amendment is to do with option four. Um, option four was put on the table without much evidence, discussion or debate at scrutiny. 
and it has now been changed without much evidence, discussion or debate at Cabinet. And the problem with option four, option four, and my amendment is that it should be deleted, is the problem with option four is that the whole scrutiny, the whole governance review is to actually enhance democracy, enhance community engagement, and actually reflect, reflect uh, um, organizations. And to have, to have parish councils based on the county divisions does not reflect the community interests. In fact, I do remember, members, when we set up the county divisions, there was an argument about whether we should call it Cooden or Little Common because it actually straddled both areas of, and I would think Cooden and Little Common do have separate identities. So clearly the county divisions will not do the job that we're supposed to be doing in terms of a governance review. Um, also in our part one consultation, it had the least support, it was 0.1% of, of support, the least support of any of the options. Um, also, it would mean that the people of Exhill, their precept would be higher because it would be spread out over a smaller number of residents. So basing it on the county divisions, which were created simply to balance up members with number of residents, not to do with communities. In fact, some of them just go down the middle of the road, I understand. So I don't think this should be consulted on at all. It wasn't something that the steering group wanted. And in fact, it wasn't something that the scrutiny wanted. And my, so I'm going to move that this be deleted from the consultation. And I hope I have a seconder for that. Is there a seconder from Councillor Oliver? Um, Councillor Barnes, I think you would like to speak. I hope this is working, Chairman. <laughs> it seems to be the first one of the evening. Um, I want to uh, speak against that amendment. We're going ahead with part two of the consultation. I favor that, even though we had an extremely limited democratic vote. 10% uh, petition, somewhere between two and 3% actually then bothered to take part in the consultation. Uh, I think actually, as a representative of a parish council, I'm in favor of consulting on how Bexhill wants to be represented. But to allow 2% to determine the agenda of what you consult on seems to me inherently undemocratic. We should offer a wide range of alternatives. I want to address, I didn't quite follow the logic of council project. She appeared to say the county division didn't represent her community because Little, Common, and Kuden had a separate identity. If that is so, then the logic of her position would be to advocate a separate parish council for Kuden and a separate one for Little Common. And therefore, her amendment should, in fact, be for five parish councils uh, rather than to oppose consulting on parish councils at all. The reason why, and I've made this point at Cabinet, but of course Councillor Prochak was not present to actually hear it. The reason why I think we do need to consider whether Bexhill is a single community or made up of several communities is that I represent a ward that sometimes feels neglected by the town council of which it is formally a part and of which it forms a ward. I've seen town councils in operation. I've seen large parish councils in operation, and sometimes they don't fully represent the communities they purport to represent. And therefore, I think we should offer an option to the people of Bakes Hill to decide whether they want a single town council or whether there are four or five communities. Well, I had in mind particularly Sibley, which seems to me to have a totally separate identity and totally separate interests, I think they need a right to actually vote on whether they think that that is so. Otherwise, I can see Bex Hill 
drawing all the finances into the centre of Bakes Hill and actually putting them out at the charge of the various communities. A town council either needs to be warded or indeed you need perhaps to have a body that is fighting for the interests of Kuden and indeed for Sydney. My last point, and I did not myself, because I don't know Bakes Hill well enough, I did not put forward four originally. I had no number in mind. I decided that actually four is not too bad because when you actually have to decide your warding, you do actually take into account community interests. That is what the Boundary Commission says. Thank you, so Councillor It's not just Bons. about equal numbers. That is I oppose the amendment. Thank you. Uh, is oh, uh, Councillor Kenwood. Chairman, just to, to be fair, I, I would have thought that that option could be looked again when the steering group meet if, uh, if, if the council so desired that rather than have a vote on it this evening. Thank you. Um, Councillor Osborne. Thank you much, Chairman. Um, yeah, we had a, um, at, at the scrutiny meeting, we had a, quite a long discussion on this. We had a, probably a good hour on this mm -hmm. in total. Um, we were concerned you know, we, we were concerned that um, we didn't want the countryside to be paying for Bexhill Town Council. We were told we were working on originally uh, £10,000 for the leaflet drop, and by the time we got to Cabinet, the cost had increased to 15 or 14 and a half or so. So that's, that's a reason that that was there. Um, and we were concerned, um, again, as I said, of the countryside paying for Bexhill. Now, as a country member of, you know, 20 miles away from here and a past mayor and chairman of a town council. I have absolutely no issue if Bexhill wants its own town council. But what I would say is that we, were as, a, as a committee, were disappointed with the amount of people who had attended our meeting and, again, the responses from the original consultation, which I think there was some, uh, you know, sort of 1,200 or so on the sort of requesting for the consultation to go ahead. And then when it actually starts, we only get sort of 700 responses. And that we found was disappointing. And what I would say to the residents of Bexhill is if you want to do this, then you've got to, you've got to get Bexhill behind you and actually come up with some decent numbers to satisfy <coughs> everybody. If Bexhill wants a town council, personally, who am I to say you can't have it because I live 20 miles away? but Bexhill has got to pay for it, and I don't want my residents in Eastern Robert to be paying for it. Thank you. Councillor Oliver. <coughs> I'm sure I was, uh, I was in another little world then. Um, thank you very much indeed. I think I'd just like to put to rest or, or, or make some comments on some of these numbers that are recorded in the Cabinet meeting, because I wasn't actually here at the time. This number of disappointing, somebody mentioned it was pitiful. You know, I don't think it was pitiful about almost a thousand people writing an essay in the consultation stage one, which was the highest return that Rother have ever had in a consultation. So let's, let's, let's put it into perspective. And while we're banding around on numbers and statistics, let's look at the statistic just, just because numbers have been very, very misleading. Let's look at the numbers in the last county council elections where only 20% of the electorate decided to vote 23% for the Conservative Party, but there we are, they um, had to Councillor reserve. Oliver, the point uh, I'm, no, um, uh, I, no, uh, Councillor Oliver, please. Uh, I think you must speak to the amendment. I think you're going slightly off track. I, well, I, in so much as the, the information is here for discussion, I thought this was the opportunity it to is, discuss. It is, but you must only speak to the amendment. Uh, so we don't have an opportunity to discuss? Well, I'm sorry, but if you've heard that there is going to be a steering committee, I, I suggest you confine your remarks to them. So all this information that's in here, which is incorrect, some of it, and the fact that um, uh, D4B have already made a predetermined decision, which isn't the case, because in the by-election last year, the Tory party said they would not support a town Oliver, council. We do not bring politics into this sort of discussion. Oh. Please, please, please. Well, that's, thank you so much. Please, please, can we confine ourselves to what is the amendment? You are speaking to the amendment. 
Right. Okay. Councillor Clark. I'm independent, I'm not political. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say, one of the problems we've got is this torturous process, this consultation. The first consultation is really expression of interest. Do, do you think Bexhill should have a town council and this sort of thing? But the problem I've had with my residents in my ward, and I'm sure a lot of residents in Bexhill who are interested will say this, is yes, maybe I'll be interested in a town council, but what does it cost? And then until people have some figures about what is the cost on the Bexel precept and how much it will cost a year and how much extra going to have to pay for town council, then I think a lot of people are sitting on their hands who would possibly be in favour. But until we're actually able to package the next stage of the consultation and say, these are the options, these are the costings, is it something you're interested in? And that, I think, is one of the reasons why we've not had the percentage of people turning out that we would, would hope, because it's a simple enough question. If you offer somebody something, they want to know what it costs. And we have not been able to do that yet. So I think that's a very valid point. And I don't favour... Sorry? You obviously got a short memory, because one of your members said exactly what I'd said just now about the poor if, uh, numbers of people that had, that had uh, corresponded to the consultation. That was one of your own members, so I'm not saying what they said. I, I'm not in favour of splitting the four sections. I think the people of Bexhill, when it's costly, should have the opportunity to support a town council. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Clark. Councillor Hollidge. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I Thank you, Madam Chairman. I thought the uh, proposal by Councillor Kenwood, seconded by myself, was that it was going to go back to the steering group, which I thought was quite right. But in terms of misinformation, uh, just like to clarify the, the point about the cost, because the element about no cost to the council was quite correct. If we do a postal um, out, the cost to us will be £14,500 just to Bexhill. Because air option three is on the agenda, it would be double that because we would have to send a postal vote to every member of Rother District Council. So the saving, if we didn't do a postal vote, would be more in the order of £28,000. But it's quite right that it goes back because there needs to be clarity with figures and how the process of stage two consultation is taken about. So the proposal, um, I think that we made was right and it's been carried. Um, we, we we mustn't lose sight of what the amendment's about. Could we please now vote on that amendment, Councillor Prochak's amendment? Those in favour? Oh, Councillor Prochak, would you be kind enough to, to read out your amendment, please? Yes, it's, it's very straightforward, Madam Chair, which is basically to delete option four. Did you all hear that? The, the amendment is to delete option four. Um, could I have those in favour, please? And those against? Right. Thank you. Um, the amendment is defeated. So the decision taken from tonight is that um, this will go back to the steering group for further consultation. Chair. Right. Excuse me. Could I just have some clarification again? Yes. So we've voted on an amendment which has been passed. We've voted on an amendment which has failed. Right. And now we have a substantive motion. Are we going to debate that substantive motion, which includes the past amendment? Is there a substantive? I'm corrected, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we now need to, to debate the substantive motion. So, um, Councillor Hart. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I've heard all the chat tonight about um, uh, the amendments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, uh, and I absolutely uh, am in favour of localism. If the people of Bexhill um, would like to have a parish, a town council, an area committee. That is up to the people of Bexhill. But I do think it's very important that more people in Bexhill do come forward um, 
to have their views known about what they want, because at the moment, in the first stage of the consultation, we've got less than 3% of the people in Bexhill who have given a view at all. And the thing is, you've got to balance the financial implications with the reality of the situation. Um, and so when you're looking at, let's say, for an example, a town council or a parish council, I've done a bit of research, and I think it's very important when you're looking at the various points. town council, um, it's on average about £200,000 per annum, the cost of running a town council. You've got the staff, the admin, the elected officials, which is elected councillors, and um, also money for initiatives, projects, and that sort of thing. So I think it's very important that the people of Bexhill, no matter what governance they choose or not, that the financial implications must be made very clear. And it's very clear that the Bexhill residents would have an increase on their preset, and I really wouldn't want that passed to the rather rural residents as well. As a rural um, council councillor, I feel very, very strongly that um, the, the, the rural district doesn't have to pay for Bex Hill, particularly where it comes to an area committee where there's been no demand at all from rural rather about that sort of thing. So thank you. Councillor Kenwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted you to confirm something for me. Um, my understanding would be my amendment would become the substantive yes. motion, and therefore yeah. that's what we're debating. Exactly. But we've already, yes? Thank you. Councillor Field, and then Councillor Patrick. Yes, thank you. I'm particularly concerned about the no extra cost part of this substantive motion uh, for several reasons. First of all, if we have a budget defined and the consultation was planned to be within that budget, it seems to me we have two things in front of us. Either we degrade the consultation or we don't change it, in which case we haven't moved any further forward. Now, I think, and I do disagree with Councillor Hart here, because I have heard many rural residents over many years say what Bexhill needs is a town council, then we can have a clearer say on rather as it covers rural areas. So I, I, my bit of the world wouldn't agree with that. But I do think if we're going to change the constitution of the way Bexhill is governed, we need to make sure that it is extremely easy for people to respond. And that may well involve extra cost. Now, I have a, an inclination, an inkling here, that this probably is a once in a generation thing. We're not going to keep coming back to this to get a different answer every time. So if it is going to happen only once in the very foreseeable future, we need to make sure it is got right. And it will only be right Could I ask that members of the public refrain from, from actually uh, attempting to take part in this debate, please? <laughs> it will only be right if the maximum number of people are able to respond and feel there is some point in responding, which is why I'm extremely concerned about the cost constraint on this consultation, because I fear it will make not a lot of difference and it will end the situation with the council makes the decision and an awful lot of people in Bexhill are still very unhappy and feel disenfranchised. Thank you. Councillor Prochak. Thank you, Chair. Just for a point, as a, a point of order is that I can speak twice because I was speaking on the amendment now. I I'm just checked, sub yes. Sub yes. Substantive motion. Um, just a few points. It's very, very difficult to actually get some of these ideas across in terms of cost, etc. So, for example, if you have a town council or parish council, they automatically get 15% of community infrastructure levy. That is a considerable amount in Bexhill. And also, it helps our budget, rather district council's budget, because any costs that are, are borne by a Bexhill town council, not capped, we are, comes off our budget. So that helps our budget enormously, if you're talking about finances. And we know in the parishes that we pay for our street lighting, our bus shelters, 
a whole raft of things that we pay for. But actually, we are also paying for some of Bex Hills as well. So that will have clarity about what services are paid for by which residents. So it seems to me that Bex Hill, being one of the very few, I think something like four, four towns in the whole of the UK that doesn't have its own town council. And it feels to me the time has come. And the time has come, but the political will, sorry, Madam Chairman, but it is political, the political will does not seem to be there because we know, and the executive knows, and all those conservatives who voted against the amendment, they know that actually amateurs producing their own postcards, which you've said they can't do, is not going to do the job, is it? Other places go for a referendum. And that is the only way you would get considerable numbers back to you to say we want change. We haven't got the budget for the referendum. And so far, we're seeing not even a budget for a consultation. If we don't have that consultation, then we will be accused of not running this properly. And that's a judicial review system. We must run this properly. And in the end, I think, my view is that the Conservative group have made their views quite clear already. And they will make their views clear right to the end, I'm sure. Councillor Barnes. I don't propose, Madam Chairman, to be tempted into debating the merits or otherwise of any particular solution. That is not the motion in front of us. The motion is to go back to the committee to define very clearly what is on offer. And I agree with Councillor Prochak uh, that actually we need to make very clear what the various bodies can do and what they can't do. One of the things that came out of this consultation was that a lot of the people were voting for a Bexhill Town Council as if it were a borough council, as if it could do things about the National Health Service, which it can't. So we do need to be absolutely clear what is actually open to any one of these particular bodies. And parish councils have certain powers, which I value, and I speak as the chairman of the parish council, so I'm hardly going to uh, deny my own existence or my own value. Uh, but we do need to make clear precisely what can and can't be done. Secondly, you can assess minimum costs. You can assess the costs of running a parish council. You can assess the costs of running a town council. You can make a reasonable estimate uh, for the office costs because you will have to have a base, a property, in which you actually operate. If you're a town council, you may well have to have a council chamber. If you're a parish council, you usually make do with the village hall. But there will be costs to that, and we need to assess those. But at the end of the day, you can't assess the true cost, because what happens is that you precept to do certain things as a parish council. And if I look at Folkestone, which is a town council, they probably spend something of the order of 700,000 pounds a year. Uh, there are others that spend more, there are others that spend less. There's a huge range, again, of what parish councils spend. We can inform people, we should inform people. We have a good system in the website, in my alerts, and various things which could actually begin to induce people to take a serious interest and decide what is in the interest of the people of Bates Hill. And that is really what we want the next session of the Consultation Committee to do, is to actually draw out the information and make it quite clear so that we can consult properly and not improperly. Thank you. Councillor Oliver. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. And I endorse exactly what uh, uh, Councillor um, John Barnes has to say with regard of information. It's absolutely vital we get this information. There's information that's being thrown up in the air and we don't really know what the costs are. My colleague, um, Councillor Clark, identifies his residents want to know what would the cost be. So that's not unreasonable to do that. And therefore, for us to communicate with residents by mail through their letterbox with a document that's identifying the options and the cost is surely it's got to be the way of doing it. 
You know, why do we go down this method of saying, okay, one or two public engagements out on Sainsbury's and Tesco's, um, uh, do it online, get people engaged, but let's get it through the letterbox and let's encourage people to come back to us. The question I'd like to ask, the budget originally was a figure, I believe, that if a referendum was involved, it could be as much as 40 or 50,000 pounds. How much have we spent so far? Why is this mailing of 14,000 that started at 10 has gone to 14? Is it within the budget? Is it outside of the budget? Had we, had, had we put aside an amount, perhaps, to, to consult at stage two by way of mailing out? It all seems to be very, very sort of wishy-wishy, and we're going back to the, the steering group to come up with recommendations, which we put a lot of work in, came back with a recommendation, scrutiny, sort of whatever, and then cabinet. Why did you just go to cabinet? Let them sort it out. They seem to know all the answers. There's one more question. Thank you. Councillor Earl. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I'm, I'm very saddened in many ways by the whole debate that we are putting a price on democracy in our community and setting one urban against the, the rural. We should be looking at the positives that were going forward. If we were open and transparent with all our residents, with something going through the letterbox, giving them a choice with facts and figures, we could as the elected members sit here and make a decision that is truly democratic. We ask everybody their opinion. But at the moment, we're looking at negatives, what it's going to cost, not what it could deliver. We could actually make the uh, attraction of Rother with the whole community here in Bexhill being up for improvements. We could be open and honest and go to people and say to them, we would like to improve this and do this or do that. Would you be prepared to pay extra? At the moment, they have no idea what any improvements would cost. They have, and I can't see why we are putting up objections from, to the people who've elected us to, to be open and democratic. Let us be honest with people and, and actually say, this is what, exactly what, Councillor Clark said, this is what it's going to cost. You have a choice. You can say, leave it as it is, we're happy, forget it. You'll get the answer and then we all have to actually agree. We don't have to be setting a, a time and effort and energy into something that they don't want. But at the moment, they haven't got a choice. And if we don't send out directly through every letterbox, they will not get a choice. We are leaving it to uh, people, volunteers and whatever, to get out there and talk to people. And you cannot cover 40,000 people um, by either email, websites, or standing in the street. Put it through the letterbox. Don't let's, you know, spoil the future of Rother District Council and Bexhill for 14,500 pounds. <coughs> it just not worth it. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor. Um, there are three more speakers waiting, um, Councillor Kentfield, Councillor Kirby Green, and then I shall ask Councillor Maynard. Uh, you've spoken once. Madam Chairman, if I may, I've sat here listening to the debate this evening, and one or two things have come very clear to me, and I'm very disappointed with those things. The members sitting behind me have obviously not read, read the scrutiny report at all. There is a mass of information in there of what various town councils have cost throughout the country. The reference about the residents of the rural areas don't want to pay for Bexhill things. Well, Bexhill doesn't actually complain about paying for their refuge collections. Because the refuge collections in the rurals are far, far more costly than in Bexhill. Purely and simply on logistics. What the response was, that first of all, we had started off with 4,000 responses. We now end up with 900. And some of those didn't bother even to put their 
postal code on, so we don't know where they actually came from. That is less than 2% of the residents in Bexhill. The rest of the people had quite a lot of knowledge about what was going on, because it was talked about. And all of us get around our patches. We know what members are talking about. They're asking questions. Should we give them the answers we know? We don't know, we say we don't know. But to try and say that this is what Bexhill wants with 780 people out of 40,000, I think that's stretching the imagination a rather bit too far. And I think if we can get the information out in the normal ways of the websites and such like, and communication verbally, and as we propose to stand around the district, around the town um, on numerous occasions in the future, I think that's the best way forward with a reasonable amount of expenditure. And I don't <coughs> think 14,000 pounds spent for the responses of 700 people. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Councillor Kirby Green. No, it's, yeah, Councillor Kempfield has actually covered a lot of what I wanted to say. But I just want to confirm it's less than 2% of people in Bexhill have responded. And we keep talk, referring to £14,000. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it's not 14000 it's 28000 Because by having the area committee as one of the options, you have to actually ask the residents in the rural areas as to whether they want to go ahead with that. So it would cost 28000 And I think spending 28000 of this council's money on the basis of 700 responses in Be of Bexhill residents it is just not on, in my view. Thank you very much. Councillor Maynard. Right. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Chairman. And, and um, I think the first thing to do uh, is to reassure those members who weren't at Cabinet that Cabinet had um, a fully informed debate um, around all of the issues. Um, it was a shame there were no opposition members present. Um, that's not the first time that's happened, Madam Chairman. Um, but at, during that debate, I quite rightly thanked uh, the steering group, quite rightly thanked um, Robin Patton as the independent chairman of that steering group and this is also now is the correct time to thank those members of this council Liberal Democrats Conservatives and independent members who played a really integral part in the first part of the consultation and you know it's to, it's to those members quite unashamedly I think that we should turn to uh, now in the second part of that uh, consultation because I do think that some people in this room are a bit of a parallel universe. Since 2010, this authority has taken some £4 million a year out of its <coughs> revenue account. We have substantially had to come back, cut back on the money that we have to spend for local residents. Let me be very, very clear. If there is to be change, it will cost the residents of Bexhill money and it could well cost the residents of Rother money. The fact of the matter remains that we've, we've, we've heard today a member advocate essentially a referendum. You know, this is money that could be spent on environmental health offices. This is money that could be spent on housing benefit offices. This is money that could be spent on planning enforcement offices. I really do think that some of you are in some kind of parallel universe. For Councillor Mrs Prochak to tell us that the time has come, my immediate riposte to that will, will be, this is absolutely not the time to be spending money on governance when you should be focusing the money that we do have on the most vulnerable in Bexhill, in Battle, in Rye, and indeed in all of the villages of Rother. This is the biggest folly we've ever seen put forward and articulated by the Labour Party and indeed the Lib Dems. I think that a pragmatic attitude is the right one. We need to absolutely engage with residents on this issue because we've clearly had the original um, 4,000 residents who came who wanted obviously this issue debated and properly discussed in terms of a governance review. But Councillor Oliver referred to somebody saying that the original response was pitiful. Well, it was very low. Let's just say that. It was very low and I hope 
in the second um, tier of the consultation that we actually see more people engaged. Councillor Maynard, can you now yep, bring your... absolutely. <coughs> but it's vital that we engage giving them the correct information and dispel some of the misinformation that's been out there. Councillor Barnes referred to the Bexhill Borough Council. That's not what we're talking about. But finally, if I may, Madam Chairman, what we really need to know, and that's the role of a local member, what are the things at a local level in Bex Hill that you think we should be doing better? Because for me, as leader of this council, and indeed for local members in Bex Hill, that should be the most important issue. Because despite the financial constraints that we find ourselves in, if there's something we're not doing properly, then come and tell us. Come and talk to your local member in your respective ward in Bex Hill, and we will engage as we always should, and as I believe, we always do, regardless of political colour. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right, the, the uh, substantive motion has been moved and seconded, um, and I would now like um, to, uh, just, just for the sake of clarity, uh, to read uh, the, uh, uh, the amendment. To convene a further meeting of the steering group to formally agree the precise nature of the second stage of the Bexhill Governance Review Consultation. Please, can I have those who are in favour? And those against? Thank you very much. That is carried. Item 8. To receive the report of the Head of Paid Service. Councillor Maynard. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman. I note that there were no urgent decisions at the Cabinet meeting held on the 3rd of June. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Should we just wait? Uh, do members of the public wish to leave? Because I just give you a moment or two to leave the room. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Maynard, have you a seconder? A rather quixotically, it seems odd to be seconded. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor um, Kenwood. Um, those in favour, please. Thank you. So, any against? Thank you very much. To receive, to receive and consider the report of the Audit and Standards Committee on the following matters for determination on the 26th of June 2017. Councillor Mooney, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I am pleased to move that the report of the Audit and Standards Committee. I be think your microphone possibly could be. Yeah. Yes. Try this one. Sorry, uh, it's got to be a bit of. I'll keep hoping. Sorry, I'll say again. I, I am pleased to move that the reports of the Audit and Standards Committee, uh, which took place on the 26th of June, be approved. Thank you very much. For clarity, oh, yep. it is my, for clarity, Madam Chairman, it is my, it is my intention to reserve item SA17-06 as the Council will need to vote on the appointment of the independent persons. Thank you. Say a yes, no yes, thank you. Thank you. In that case, I will call, now call over uh, the following reports. So that's AS1706. Uh, AS1707, AS1708, AS1709, AS1710, AS1711, AS1712, AS1713, AS1714, 
AS1715, AS1716, AS1717, and AS1718. So now I move that the whole of the report, with the exception of the reserve minute, be approved and adopted or received. So Councillor Mooney. Oh, sorry, all those in favour. <laughs> Was it a seconder? Sorry, Councillor Mooney. Yes, indeed. So I propose that I can't be the seconder. No, you quite. Who, okay, who is your seconder? Oh, Councillor yes. L. Thank you. Right, all those in favour. Thank you. All those in favour? Thank you very much. All those against? Right. Councillor Mooney. Um, Chairman, I ask that a vote is taken on the appointment of independent persons, Mrs. S. Fellows, Mrs. A Mrs. J. Gray, and Mr. R. Tye. Are there any other nominations? Is there any uh, discussion? Thank you. In that, yes, in that case, uh, I consider those are elected representatives to form the... All those in favour of the three nominations, thank you very much. Anyone against? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Item 10, to receive the report of the Executive Director of Resources on the appointment of representatives to outside bodies. Councillor Maynard. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chairman. Um, can I move that the report of the Executive Director of the Business Operations be received, approved and adopted in doing so. I nominate Councillor Saltfort, sorry, <laughs> hand there. I nominate Mr. Robin Patton to be appointed as this Council's representative on the Pevensey and Cookmere Water Level Management Board in place of Councillor Hollidge. And that Councillor Ian Jenkins be nominated as Council's substitute <coughs> representative on the East Sussex Health Overview Scrutiny Committee in place of Councillor John Barnes. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Is there a seconder for this? Councillor oh, Counts Kenwood. Um, are there any other nominations? Any, any discussion? In that case, um, those people, I think. Um, all those in favour? <coughs> Thank you. All those against? Anyone against? No. Right. Thank you. So. Thank you very much indeed for attending tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and I now declare that the meeting is closed. Please rise for the Chairman of the Council.